Um, I want to thank our speaker tonight, Jeffrey Love. Um, he, he did an excellent presentation yesterday. And as I said to him earlier, when I see a presentation and then I find myself thinking about it the next day and wondering this and wondering that, that to me is kind of <coughs> the criteria of a, of a good presentation. And, and I was thinking about all of those things. Um, so Jeffrey is a research geophysicist um, with the US Geological Survey. And his research is a variety of subjects um, related to the Earth's magnetic field and, and radiation. He uh, evaluates geoelectric hazards of concern, the electrical grid, uh, and analyzes um, intense magnet magnetic storms and analysis of past, the history of past events and, and that sort of thing. Uh, he has a degree in physics and applied math at UC Berkeley and um, a PhD in um, geophysics from Harvard. And so that sets your, uh, your qualifications, I think, pretty well, Jeffrey. And so if you want to get started, it's, uh, I will turn myself okay. off here and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> I, I did have one other thing I wanted to say just before you, sure. uh, and that was that if you have questions, uh, go ahead and you can type your questions in at any time, questions or comments, but we won't get to those until we get to the end. Right. Uh, Mike, thanks again for that introduction. And, and I'm happy again to be presenting presenting to, um, to all of you folks <clears throat> down there in Southern California and other places. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the topic of my presentation today is down to earth with an electric hazard from space. Um, they have this beautiful graphic here, which I borrowed from somebody at NASA, just illustrating in a qualitative sense, the, the nature of the interaction that the earth has with the sun. Um, of course, this, the earth receives heat from the sun and light from the sun, but um, there's also a flow of, of uh, solar wind particles that uh, flow from the sun and affect the Earth's magnetic field. So in this diagram, obviously, the sun is in the lower left-hand corner and the Earth and its magnetic field are represented there in the upper right-hand corner that you can see the ball of the Earth, but <clears throat> surrounding it, those blue um, lines represent the Earth's magnetic field and how it is um, affected by the solar wind coming from the sun. Um, the solar wind compresses the magnetic field on the day side and extends it on the night side. Um, and when there are occasional bursts of solar wind um, in the form of what we call coronal mass ejections, um, the solar wind really, really becomes active and causes the Earth's magnetic field to be disturbed, um, causing what we call a magnetic storm. I'll discuss that in some, in some detail and discuss some of the implications for that for down for ground level um, technological systems. The thing I'm gonna focus on is the electric power grid. Um, and uh, it's because there are ground effects um, at the surface of the earth that the USGS, the US Geological Survey is involved with this very dynamic and very diverse uh, subject of space weather. Um, I just want to emphasize that this work, <clears throat> this work of space weather, um, USGS doesn't do all of it. We only do a tiny little part of it, although I'm very proud of what we do. Um, <clears throat> the work is, is within the federal government is distributed over a number of different federal agencies. And, and to coordinate that, there is a White House level um, committee um, called SWARM, which stands for Space Weather Operations Research and Mitigation. And I, I just am very happy with how that's all worked out. And, and I will just be frank with you. It's your tax dollars um, being well spent on issues of societal importance. So, so with that, I'll move to the next slide. <clears throat> so somebody said that um, they were hoping to catch up on some of the material that I presented yesterday. I actually showed this slide yesterday and I'm gonna talk about it again because it's important. And I just wanna, again, bring certain, certain issues, certain vocabulary to the forefront of, of your attention um, because I'm gonna use those words and, and, and go over it um, in different ways um, over the course of my presentation. All right, so it's a very quick review of electromagnetism, um, four different, principles that were discovered by four different people. 
um, over uh, the last couple of centuries. Um, the first and perhaps the most basic is that due to Andre Marie Ampere, um, who understood that, that when you have an electric current, you have a magnetic field. So around a current, say in a wire, there is a, mag there is a field, a force field that's generated. And um, he was the first to really understand that. And in some sense, you can um, view magnetic fields and currents as kind of equivalent. When you have a current, you have a magnetic field. And when you have a magnetic field, you know there is a current somewhere. So the second law is due to Michael Faraday, <clears throat> famous British scientist, experimentalist, under who really <clears throat> understood for the first time that time varying magnetic fields, that is magnetic fields that are changing in time, induce or generate electric fields, all right? So under uh, Ampere's law is essentially a static statement. When you have a current, you have a magnetic field. But when you, in Faraday's law, when you have a time dependent magnetic field, you can ad induce or generate additional electric fields. So that's an interesting um, kind of reaction um, that uh, is, is generated with the presence of a time varying magnetic field. And that, that principle um, is the basis of electric generators and electric motors. Um, there are varying time varying magnetic fields in both and they either, either induce or, or rely on um, electric currents. And the third law is due to um, Ohm. George Simon Ohm was a German scientist, <clears throat> experimentalist um, who understood that in an electrical conductor, electric current is proportional to the electric field. So electric fields can drive the flow of electric charges. And that proportionality is the conductivity of the material. And that's an important law, not so much yesterday, but for today's uh, um, discussion that will come up again. <clears throat> and then finally, the uh, law due to Lorentz. Um, um, it's a little bit less important in today's discussion, but, but basically when you have electric charges like electrons or protons um, and they are, um, uh, moving with respect to a magnetic field, they experience a force. And in that respect, magnetic fields are force fields. So there we are, quick review of electromagnetism. Um, another th issue that I want to kind of, you know, bring up to um, the forefront of your attention are the different states of matter, because um, this is important for today's discussion as well. Um, you probably are familiar that matter, material, has has different kinds of forms. Um, we have solid where the atoms in the material are essentially fixed relative to each other. And so the, the substance is, has a stiffness. Um, liquids um, where the atoms can move relative to each other, but the overall volume is preserved. And a gas where the atoms again can move, but they, they don't maintain a constant volume. And then finally, the state that I want to emphasize for today's discussion is plasma. Um, and it's a, it's, in, in some respects, it's like a gas, except that there's so much energy been put into the gas that the electrons that normally orbit around atomic nuclei have actually been disassociated. They aren't orbiting anymore around the nuclei. Electrons and nuclei are all kind of mixed together in, um, in this kind of hot bath of material. Um, it's a really good electrical conductor because the charges can flow really easily. And uh, that's basically what solar wind is made out of. It's made out of plasma because the plasma from the sun is so hot. So there we are. All right, so this is a, a movie which qualitatively depicts the, um, depicts, oh, sorry, I'm gonna have it back up there. Uh, little technical difficulty, apologize. Okay, maybe I need to back up more. <laughs> Every presenter's nightmare. Okay, I'm going to keep trying to back up. Okay, I uh, don't know exactly what's happened. I apologize for that. And uh, whoops, I've got too much going on here. Okay, there we are. That's backed up and let's see what happens if I go forward. It's supposed to play. Oh my gosh, okay, there we are. Okay, so it's playing there, thank, you. thank God. <clears throat> um, so this uh, movie will loop around and I'll discuss it a couple of times. It's not very long, but it's useful for explanation. 
Um, basically, uh, if we uh, wait here just patiently a little bit, I hope it starts over again. Come on, guy, there we are. So there we are at the sun. Um, and like I was talking about in that first slide, there are occasionally emissions of, of plasma. And if that plasma happens to be directed towards the earth, again, it's electrically conducting, it interacts with the earth's magnetic field and compresses it on the day side, extends it on the night side. On the night side, there's an interesting phenomenon called reconnection, um, which is shown right there where um, the, the magnetic field lines rearrange and redirect electric charges into and out of the Earth's atmosphere and cause aurora borealis. Again, I'll just walk you through it here. Um, coronal mass ejection of, of electrically conducting plasma traversing the Earth-Sun distance takes usually a couple of days. Uh, if it arrives at the Earth, it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, compresses it and extends it on the night side. That reconnection there redirects electric charges into and out of the atmosphere and causes aurora borealis. So that's a magnetic storm. It's a period of time when the Earth's magnetic field is active or time dependent. It's also a period of time when at high latitudes normally you would, you would see aurora borealis. Um, and for a really active magnetic storm, sometimes that aurora is visible at lower latitudes like across the contiguous United States. Um, maybe not so very often in Southern California, but it has happened where um, there have been storms strong enough that you can see aurora even in Southern California. All right, so that's a, a brief introduction to space weather and magnetic storms. I'm gonna concentrate on a certain aspect of magnetic storms. And this is really a subject that I work on. Um, and I just want to you know, basically advertise some of the work that we're doing so that you know, know some of the um, things that are going on in the federal government to keep the government keep the um, nation prepared for different kinds of hazards including hazards that come from space um, this work is really a collaboration uh, with colleagues I have some really good and talented and um, good people colleagues um, and I just want to acknowledge their role in all of this Anna Kelbert Josh Riegler Ben Murphy, who work in my group at the USGS. I also work with a guy named Greg Lucas at the University of Colorado, who used to, used to work for us as a postdoc, but now he has a permanent job there at the University of Colorado. And Paul Bedrosian, who works at the USGS, but in a different part of the USGS. Um, and like I say, these I rely on these people. Um, and I think we've done a lot of great work together and I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of that, so. All right, so I emphasize something that is that we all know, but um, again, bringing it to your your attention, um, our nation depends on electricity. You know, modern society can't function without electricity. This is a picture of the eastern United States. Um, maybe some of you recognize that. Um, it's a very nice picture. It's taken from the space station. You can see a little bit of, of it off there on the left. And by the way, you can see some aurora there on the horizon. But that aurora is uh, over a part of the eastern United States, which is very beautiful at night. Um, the clouds have cleared and it shows there, right there in the kind of, I'll highlight it with my cursor, that's New York City. Um, and up here is Boston. So Boston, New York City, this is Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, uh, Richmond, Virginia, and Norfolk, Virginia. Virginia. Um, you know, our our society depends on electricity, and this really is a visual representation of that. I'm showing you the eastern United States for a reason. Um, it's because the geoelectric hazards that we've been understanding that are caused by magnetic storms are actually most prominent in the eastern United States. And um, this, is, this is important to understand. Um, I don't know what it is. It's, it's pretty close to half, the, half of the country lives there. Um, you know, that's it's, that's our that's the megalopolis of North America, um, our nation's capital, our nation's biggest city, um, and and if uh, they were to lose electricity, that would be a problem. Um, I think you can understand and, and really um, uh, understating it by just saying it would be a problem, be serious problem. So there we are. So we uh, the the government of the United States put some effort into making sure that our grid is secure, the electricity grid is secure. Um, 
there's a lot of work to do. Um, I'm not saying it's all all done and that it's everything is is as secure as we might want it to be, but we are doing research and understanding the hazards so that we can make our society more resilient to uh, different kinds of hazards, including space weather. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a magnetic storm that occurred in 1989. Um, and if you could just hold on one second, I just need to get something here. <clears throat> Apologize for that little distraction, but I uh, I need to keep on schedule, so I need to my my watch. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the March 1989 magnetic superstorm. <coughs> it's it is um, I think it's fair to say the magnetic storm that has caused that had the most impact for technological systems, and there's a couple of reasons for that. For one thing, it was a big and very active magnetic storm. But it also occurred relatively recently, March 1989. You know, um, other storms that I've studied, some of them occurred in the 19th century. Um, and we weren't so dependent on electrical technology in the 19th century as we are today. The March 1989 storm, although smaller than some of the other storms that occurred further back in time, had a lot of impact. Um, it's probably best known for the impact that it had in Canada, it, it caused an electricity blackout in Canada, brought, it took out the entire power grid for Quebec um, and left the entire province without electricity um, for, I don't know, six or nine hours. And, um, you know, that may or may not sound like a big deal. I mean, sometimes we have blackouts <clears throat> for all kinds of purpose, all kinds of reasons like hurricanes or, um, or very significant uh, cold storms that um, can can affect power grids, um, but in a sense, this is this storm is a, is an alert, an alert to uh, the power grid industry, an alert to people like me that you know space weather can have an effect on things going on, on the Earth's surface. March nineteen eighty nine had a lot of effects. But there have been more intense storms in the past. What would happen if we had an intense storm like that, which occurred in September 8, 1859, something known as the Carrington event, which some of you might have heard of. Other storms more intense than that of March 1989 occurred in 1909, 1921. <clears throat> um, you know, the power grid that we have today, it's been optimized for profit. And um, it's reasonable to ask how how uh, resilient it is, you know, when you optimize something, you kind of might in the process be making it more delicate. And so uh, a reasonable question is how resilient is the power grid that we have that supports our economy to things like the magnet, the magnetic storm. Um, <clears throat> so we're, uh, scientists are concerned about what a future occurrence of a magnetic superstorm, even more intense than 1989, and maybe as intense as that of the Carrington event in 1859, what would be the effect of, on that for the United States? And it is possibly quite concerning. Um, there are estimates that it could have a, an impact on the economy to the tune of one or two trillion dollars. Um, and, and that kind of cost to the economy comes because a magnetic storm can damage electric power grid infrastructure. And sometimes that infrastructure can take a long time to replace. And, and for that reason, there can potentially be significant economic imp impact. Just as an example, in the upper right-hand corner, showing you a high-voltage power transformer that is in, was in Salem, New Jersey, that was damaged during the March 1989 storm. There's a man there standing in front of the transformer. It's a big piece of... Yeah, you know, metallic infrastructure. <clears throat> um, inside, there are coils of wire, and it's shown there on the top right. Normally, those coils of wire would be very nicely arranged. They have insulation on them. <clears throat> um, you can see that's all burned off, um, and that's a result of the magnetic storm. Magnetic storm induced electric fields in the crust of the Earth, and that drove currents in through ground connections into the power grid system and upset the 
you know, delicate operations of the of the electric power grid and and caused a damage to this particular transformer. Again, March 1989, we we know that more intense magnetic storms can occur and might occur in the future. For, and for that reason, we're interested in this subject. All right, so I'll just briefly discuss some of the science that's involved here. Um, this is a, a cartoon, but it's a cartoon that represents qualitatively what we're talking about here. You know, I showed you that movie, um, coronal mass ejection of plasma from the sun arriving at the earth, affecting the earth's magnetic field. <clears throat> um, it's basically generating electric currents in the space environment above our heads. And according to Ampere's law, when we have electric currents, we have magnetic fields. And furthermore, if those currents are time dependent, according to Ampere, according to Faraday's law, the time dependent magnetic field can generate electric fields in electrical conductors. And that, that's what can happen um, at, in the earth. So a, a space based current generates a magnetic field and that can induce or generate electric fields in the crust of the earth in the crust and mantle of the earth. <clears throat> now, the, efficiency with which that electric field drives electric currents, according to Ohm's law, um, depends on the conductivity of the material. And rock um, has very different kinds of electrical conductivity, depending on the mineralogy and the, the uh, phase, phase qualities of the rock and um, the, the water content of the rock. And some parts of the solid earth are very good electrical conductors, and other parts are quite resistive. Now, if you happen to have a power grid deployed across a rock structure, which is not very conductive, um, that means that the electric field has a hard time getting charges to flow through the rock. Um, but if that grid is situated across that rock structure, the current will just flow through the power grid, um, coming through ground connections, which are typically at transformer stations. So there you have a power grid system, which is designed for controlling alternating current. And you have now a new current that's been um, subjected to this power grid system. It's a current which is quasi direct. It's not changing ver that rapidly in time, not like at 50 Hertz, um, changing in time, but rel relatively slowly and it's uncontrolled. Um, and that is really the crux of the problem for the power grid industry and the magnetic storms. All right, so our objective here is to make a map, make a map and understand where in the United States these rock structures are, are relatively resistive and where in the United States um, we have high levels of magnetic storm activity, combine that together to try to make a hazard map showing where the power grid industry has its greatest challenges from this particular hazard. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly say that this kind of analysis uh, it can be expressed formally in terms of what scientists describe as time series analysis and filters and so on and so forth. But basically we're looking at geomagnetic field variation represented here by the sun and its driving qualities for the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and the interaction of that geomagnetic field variation with the crust of the Earth, and here just showing you kind of a geological model, in this case actually of Virginia. Um, and the, the result of the geomagnetic field interaction with the solid Earth gives geoelectric fields, which are of concern for the power grid industry. And this analysis uh, exploits a couple of important data sets that the USGS and my group in particular has been involved in collecting. We operate a network of, of magnetic observatories. These are stations um, across the United States where we regularly and constantly are measuring the Earth's magnetic field and its variation. We can record magnetic storms, for example, um, with those facilities. We're also gonna combine that with some survey data um, where measurements are made of the electromagnetic properties of the solid earth, combine these two sets of data to get these hazard maps that I'm discussing. That's, that's what I'll talk about in some little bit more detail now. So I just briefly wanna say the, the main part of um, the mission of the program that I work with is the operation of these magnetic observatories 
Um, they are very interesting um, facilities. Some of them have been in continuous operation for over 100 years. Um, they provide us with an understanding of the history of geomagnetic disturbance. And they're also useful for making maps of the um, Earth's magnetic field. I showed you a few of those maps yesterday. Um, and so we have 14 of these observatories. They stretch from Guam in the Pacific to San Juan, Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, all the way up to Alaska. The data are collected in real time and brought to our, um, our headquarters in Golden, Colorado, where we analyze them. And um, our operations here are coordinated with the operations in other countries. Other countries also operate observatories. Canada has a number of them and so on. And that coordination on international scale um, is done through an international organization known as Intermagnet. Um, we have a number of operational partnerships, um, including with the oil and gas industry. I'm not going to talk about that today, um, but it's an interesting set, set of applications for geomagnetic data. Um, we're a tiny little program within the USGS um, in a relative sense. We have an annual budget of $2 million a year. Um, that um, actually is not that much money when you consider that we have uh, 14 employees um, and we operate all of these facilities, um, far flung facilities and keep it all going in real time. Um, I think we get quite a lot of bang for the buck um, uh, for the investment that the country makes in this uh, geomagnetism program within the USGS. We have actually had a recent plus up um, to do some uh, magnetotelluric surveying. I was you know, mentioning that in the previous slide and I'm going to discuss that in a little bit more detail here. Um, and I also want to acknowledge all the operational staff who keep all of this stuff going. I mean, it's really quite impressive. Um, and Chrissy Lewis, who is the operations lead, the group leader of the geomagnetism program. So I mentioned a little bit about um, surveying work that's being done. Um, there, there has been since 2006, a, a coordinated project for measuring the electromagnetic properties of the solid earth across uh, the contiguous United States. Um, it was a project that was first started by the National Science Foundation, had a little bit of money from NASA, but now um, Congress has allotted money to the USGS to complete the survey. Um, we're working um, in the southern sector here to complete the survey. Um, what I'm showing here on this map our maps or is a map which um, which demonstrates a quality of the electromagnetic quality of the solid earth known as impedance. It's basically a description of the relationship between geomagnetic disturbance and the induced electric field. Um, and it shows some very interesting things. Um, for one thing, it shows that the electromagnetic properties of, of the contiguous United States are not the same everywhere. They are different in different places. And if the, um, if the symbol there that I'm showing on that map is large and orange, that means that the impedance is high. Um, and that means that for a given amount of geomagnetic field variation, you get a lot of induced electric field. Um, we also see that, that it's high in the, in the upper Midwest. We also see that it's high in the Eastern United States. It has a different property in the Eastern United States. It's not only high, but it's highly polarized. And for that reason, the symbols that I'm plotting there have a very kind of needle-like shape. Um, the, just want to emphasize the impedance is high there. Even the symbols are maybe a little bit hard to see in some places, but they're needle-shaped. And that means that the electric field that is generated in that part of the United States is polarized. Um, this is a very useful uh, data set. Uh, the, the data are used for fundamental understanding of geological nature of the, of the United States. It's uh, uh, data, these are data that are useful for mineral exploration and, and assessment of mineral resources. <clears throat> um, but we're gonna use them here for assessing geoelectric hazards. Again, marrying that to the magnetic observatory data to better understand the geoelectric hazards that we have during magnetic storms. So I'm just going to now jump to some conclusions, actually, um, of, of a lot of work. I've just breezed right over it here. Um, a lot of work that's taking years to put together. On the left, uh, I'm showing a, a hazard map. Um, this shows the geoelectric amplitude that was realized during the March 1989 storm. Um, it's the geoelectric field 
generated in the Earth's interior by this storm's magnetic activity. And it shows very clearly um, where it's bright orange that the geoelectric field is quite high amplitude in the northern Midwest and in the eastern United States. It's a very low amplitude in or across most of the rest of the United States. So this is useful information for the power grid industry. This tells them where they need to concentrate their efforts. Um, if they want to make their power grid system resilient, um, you can look at this map and understand where they need to concentrate their efforts. And that is in the upper Midwest and Eastern United States. And just for comparison, um, the, the impact on the power grid system that was actually realized in March, 1989. So this is actual operational difficulties that were experienced by electricity uh, transmission companies in the United States. And I'm showing the locations there on the right. Um, you can see that they're concentrated in the north and northeast United States and actually everything from mid-Atlantic, mid um, Virginia, all the way up to Maine. Um, and just to emphasize again, um, this is the nation's megalopolis. So everything, all these cities from Boston down to New York and Washington, DC um, are being serviced by electric power companies that were actually experiencing operational difficulties during the March, 1989 storm, including the damage that was caused to that transformer. Now, these uh, operational difficulties, they call them anomalies, um, were not so great that you know, the power grid was brought to its knees. Um, and like I say, the March 1989 storm was a big storm, but not the worst one that we might imagine because bigger ones have happened in the past. But it is a, um, an indicator, an indicator that um, operational anomalies for the power grid industry, mostly in the Northeast United States, where we also, we see on the left, have those high geoelectric hazards. So this kind of comparison, um, this geophysics that we're doing on the left and the engineering response that we have here on the right shows that there's a good correspondence. Um, we're on the right track. Um, the maps we're making of the geoelectric hazards for the United States are actually um, demonstrating that they're telling us what's going on for um, the power grid industry. And again, useful for ensuring that the power grid companies can make their systems more resilient should we have a more intense magnetic storm. <clears throat> so we've taken this analysis and taken it one step further. Um, here we have a, what we call a more formal hazard map. It shows the uh, projection um, as to what the voltage would be on the nation's power grid system generated by a magnetic storm um, of intensity that we might only experience once per hundred years. This is kind of the, the benchmark that the industry uses for understanding um, how they need to respond to uh, really rare but high consequence events like really intense magnetic storms. And again, it shows that there's high voltage um, that would be generated on the power grid lines in the Eastern United States and in the upper Midwest. <clears throat> um, just to emphasize the scale there on the right, um, it goes from about a thousand volts down to something that's quite small. Um, you know, a thousand volts may or may not sound um, like that much to you, but it actually is enough to drive currents, again, quasi-direct, not alternating currents um, that could damage damage high voltage transformers, take them out of operation and potentially cause widespread blackouts. So um, again, another uh, representation of the geoelectric hazards that we've been working on at the USGS. <clears throat> so with that, um, I've come to the end of my presentation and I'm really uh, happy to take any questions, uh, you know, clarify things or talk about things I even talked about yesterday, but you know, first maybe take questions about what I just discussed today. So thank you very much. Okay, so, so anyone who has any questions, you can type them right now into your, uh, your Q&A. And I have a couple of questions myself that uh, I'm just gonna jump in and ask. Um, so so you, you, know, you talked about the effect on, on the grounding. So basically, um, the, the, um, the ground of mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know affecting the grounding 
uh, capacity, I guess, of the Earth on the electrical connections. But what about like um, uh, inducing currents, like in? Uh, I mean, as these wave as these waves pass over like high voltage lines, you know, are they inducing currents like in the in the standing lines as well? Or yeah, they are. They, they are. are. Yes, um, okay. uncontrolled currents. Um, one thing I I perhaps didn't emphasize enough. Um, that this um, induction of these currents that you're talking about, Mike, um, is, is closely related to the geology. Um, I didn't emphasize that properly. Um, um, this eastern, I'm present, you know, showing my map again here, um, eastern United States, uh, this area where there's high geoelectric hazards is a geological structure known as the Piedmont. Um, it's a, um, a rock a type, it's a a section of rock um, that's electrically resistive. It's made of metamorphic and igneous rock and relatively resistive. And, and the currents, again, can't flow easily through that kind of rock and instead take the path of least resistance and flow through the power grid. Um, same, same is true up here in the uh, upper Midwest. Um, this is part of uh, a rock um, structure known as the Superior Craton, um, very old metamorphic, highly resistive rock structure. Again, a problem for a power grid that's stretched across that particular geologic feature. Okay, uh, Mike, sorry to jump in there, but I just needed to provide that little clarification and give the geological connection to everything that we're working on. Sure. Um, okay, so I have a question here from Nick and he says, is there a way to provide warning of magnetic storms? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I said at the very beginning that this work is, is um, distributed across multiple agencies. Um, the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which um, is responsible for, among other things, the National Weather Service, is also responsible for space weather warnings and um, you know diagnosis and diagnosis. And they monitor the sun, and they they can actually see a coronal mass ejection as it leaves the sun and they can tell if it's directed towards the earth. It takes a couple days to traverse that sun earth distance. So that's a two day warning. And that's actually really useful um, for any industry that's affected by space weather, be it satellites, the airline industry, um, geophysical surveys, or the power grid industry. So um, the power grid industry in particular when they understand that NOAA has issued a warning that uh, coronal mass ejection is on its way towards the Earth, they uh, they go into response mode. They they uh, um, uh, let their operators know they need to be aware of what could happen. They could the systems that they operate could undergo instabilities. They might have to to reroute electricity along alternate lines. They bring on additional. Uh, generating capacity to give themselves operational flexibility so that they could essentially weather the effects of uh, the magnetic storm. So providing, so that kind of two-day warning is really important and allows the industry to prepare and to get ready for what's what could happen. Okay, um, so what about communication like radio waves and things like that yeah. or satellite transmissions? Is that, is that? Uh, oh yeah. That's right, and you know, there's a whole diversity of, of, of uh, other kinds of technologies that are affected. So um, radio, over the horizon radio communication, um, which, you know, like ham, operate, ham radio operators, but also the military um, um, uses that, the airline industry uses that, um, and, and that can be quite drastically affected. Um, and in particular, during a magnetic storm, um, just so you know, the airline companies or um, airplane companies will not fly flights over the polar region of the earth. So, you know, a flight going from, say, Chicago to Beijing or something will be rerouted to take a longer route um, that doesn't take it over the most northerly part of the world so that they can maintain uh, radio communication as they need to do at all times. Um, you can imagine that the military gets quite concerned if their radio communication could be interrupted. So yeah, that's definitely a factor. GPS um, accuracy gets to oh. surveys, which are sometimes magnetic in orient and nature, um, um, have to be called off. Um, 
and 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 uh, high altitude pilots, high altitude um, airplane staff can be subjected to enhanced levels of, of radiation, which is a, a human health hazard. Um, so there's a lot of other things that I just didn't get into because there's just so much to talk about. Um, and not, not things to actually work on, um, but um, you know, I'm aware of some of those other hazards that are related to space, whether it's quite diverse and, and, and you know, quite interesting. And, and you know, ironically, um, the skies are filled with beautiful aurora borealis while all of this hazardous stuff is going on, so. Okay, uh, so, so I have a question here. Nick asks, um, uh, will the, can the current produced by magnetic storm ruin consumer electronics like computers and things? Um, yeah, uh, probably not. Um, uh, those are very small, small objects. Um, uh, when I talk about the electric powered grid, I'm talking about something that really traverses long distances across